Good morning. We are live. Another Monday edition of Coffee with Rich. It is uh, June the 21st, right after Father's Day. If you're watching this morning, I hope you had an amazing Father's Day yesterday. And John, I hope you had a good one, sir. Yes, sir. Got a Kids gave me a $25 uh, subway card. I mean, what a better Father's Day can you want? Hmm? I don't think it gets much better. Bucks. <laughs> don't spend it all in one time. No. <laughs> How about hey guys, yourself? I, hey, I, you I, had, yeah, I had a great one. I had uh, all, all four of my kids here, and uh, we just had a uh, wonderful that's time. Good. That's good. That's cool. Well, hey, uh, it is once again my great honor and privilege to have Dr. John Cronin on the show. I'm uh, very excited to have this is his third appearance. And uh, he is absolutely by far and away one of my favorite guests to have on the show. And uh, I always look forward to speaking to Dr. Cronin. As you're jumping on this morning, please like and hit that share button. Let's talk about sponsors so we can pay some bills here. We've got some amazing sponsors. Very honored to have Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. And this morning I got my run in. I got some calisthenics and, and stuff in. And later today I'm going to get that uh, strike workout in before I do jujitsu tonight with my jujitsu coach. Cody Hudson. Oh, we've got APP Hemp. My knees is cracking, John. I don't know if you can hear him over the audio, but uh, <laughs> I, I use that as a segue to talk about one of our amazing sponsors, APPHemp.com, which is Appalachian Standard. All of our amazing sponsors, use the link below, uh, AmericanWarriorShow.com. Use that link to get a discount to all of our amazing sponsors. Appalachian Standard makes some amazing CBD products that are going to help your joints. They're going to help you sleep better. Good stuff. I've said it before, guys, if, you, if you're looking at ammunition prices, you know they're still through the roof and probably not going to come down anytime soon. We're going to talk about maybe some potential inflation issues here in the States. And ammunition is a great example of those, uh, those inflationary problems that we're having. So I say all that to say that the Cool Fire Trainer is an outstanding way to keep your dry fire game alive, maintain your proficiency with your firearms, just in case you're ever faced with the gravest extreme and have to defend yourself with your firearm. Mountain Man Medical, man, we've got a co-branded trauma kit right now that you can pick up. The patches are in. All the contents are in. You can actually buy one now. Check out Mountain Man Medical for the American Warrior Society co-branded kit. Uh, it's been put together with some special op folks in mind, and uh, they helped design it. And we have it ready for you because you're far more likely to have a trauma situation that you're going to need that medical training than you are. And John, of course, was was wounded twice in Vietnam. We're going to talk about that, how trauma kits can be a lifesaver. I look forward to hearing that from John. Last but not least, Precision Holsters. Last week, I was in Montana with my business partner and dear friend, Mike Seeklander, teaching some amazing students, firearms instructor course, and I was running my Precision Holster equipment. Please check them out and all their amazing products. Thank you to the 11 folks joining us this morning. Please hit that like and share this, again, is going to be one of the, the best shows we have here with Dr. John Cronin. Good morning, sir. How are you, Rich? Uh, it's nice to be back. I'm really honored to be here for the third time. So uh, uh, I just want to tell you how much you know I'm flattered about this because it's a great show. And that, those sponsors of yours sound like some really, really decent people and uh, products up there that are absolutely necessary if you're going to be out in the bush in, in particular. Yes, sir. And uh, if anyone would know, anyone would know you would, sir. Uh, you know, I was talking to Mike last week in Montana. I said, uh, he said, who you got on the show Monday? I said, Dr. John Cronin again, man. I, I absolutely love talking to him. So um, without much further ado, let's see who's on with us so far this morning. We've got Diana. Good morning. Will is on. Says, good morning, Rich and John. Jason is on. Says, good morning, gentlemen. My, my brother Jeff is on. Good morning, Jeff. Hope you're staying well down there in Key West. Jara is on. It says, good morning, everyone. Tony is on from Brunswick, Georgia. Good morning, Tony. Will Parker, my dear friend out there in Montana. It was great training with you last week. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Please like and share. I'm going to read, uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Rich Brown. I'm the co-host and co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show, which is America's number one podcast. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, special operations officer, Etc. Etc. Want to read my bio? Check it out in the links below. I'm going to read. Uh, speaking of bios, let's read Dr. Cronin's bio. Pretty impressive. 
John R. Cronin joined the Marines at 19 and went to Vietnam twice with battalion and force reconnaissance units from 1967 to 1969, where he was wounded once during each tour. He returned to the States and completed his bachelor's in political science at the Citadel down in beautiful Charleston, South Carolina, before being commissioned back in the Marines as an infantry officer for three additional years. Following his discharge in 1976, he went to Rhodesia for four years, where he served as an officer on fire force with the Rhodesian Light Infantry, an operations officer, and as a deployed operational group second in command with the famed counter-terrorist unit, the Selu Scouts. He left Rhodesia in 1980 and in 1982 went to Cairo and then Beirut, wherever after having survived a kidnapping by the Hezbollah, he received his <coughs> master's in Middle Eastern studies and then went on to the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London for his PhD in Middle Eastern politics. He has since held a series of administrative positions in and taught international politics at the university level in the Washington, D.C. area and worked as a contract specialist on educational administrative policies in the Middle East. He currently lives in Alexandria, Virginia, with his wife and their two children. <laughs> Dr. Cronin is the author of the amazing book, The Bleed. And I, I read it first on Kindle. I ordered it on Amazon and got the book, and I am reading it again for a second time. It is that doggone good. Dr. Cronin, thank you for coming on. Well, it's uh, thank you for the bio. There uh, certainly is a... Uh, uh, a distinction with being on a show like this because of your listeners in particular. So uh, this is what I'm really gratified to uh, to be a part of because uh, you get these men and women here who are obviously good patriots and uh, and well versed in in military matters and military skills. And so uh, it's not like you have to explain yourself away around uh, you know the basics here. You can sort of jump right into things because they're very knowledgeable. So that's. That's what uh, is so good about your your sort of uh, listenership, you might say. Yeah, our, our listenership is incredible, John. And I'm, I'm so glad you make that distinction because uh, as I look down the list of people that are on this morning, I mean, there are almost every one of them are worthy of their own podcast. They are some truly exceptional men and women. And we're just Mike and I are thankful to have them. And John, I guess I want to start. Let's jump. Let's just like you said, let's know. Let's just dive right in, man. So I would love for you to take us back to third force reconnaissance in Vietnam. You know, now when you went to force reconnaissance, you had already been wounded when you were with battalion recon, right? That's right. That's right. I'd gotten hit with, uh, with battalion in 67. And uh, that, that, that pretty much put me out of action. I got shot three times. And so, I got met back back to the States and uh, it took me some doing to get back to Vietnam. I mean, the Marines were not ready to send me at all. That's a great myth that they're, you know, it's a sort of killing machine that uh, they, you know, they just want to put people into the chopper. That's not true. I really struggled to get back over there. And so uh, I finally made it in, in mid 68 and, uh, and they were, the force was looking for people who had a, a 2533, which is a radio telegraph sort of Morse code. Uh, background and that's what I and that's what I had. So when I volunteered, uh, they they snapped me right up and I went with a team up in uh, Quang Tree and I was in the bush I, uh, three hours after I arrived. It was <laughs> there was there was no getting around it. I got there, I got my my hooch, uh, put my equipment down, and guy said, "Pack up, you're going on a just sign the kill sheet and you're out of here." And so uh, three hours later, I was uh, I was on a chopper headed up to a place called uh, the Horseshoe which we get, did, got shot out of. We never could get in there. The place is so bad with NBA. Um, but it was, uh, the Marines didn't mess around. And, uh, and it was, uh, force ran a lot smaller teams than battalion. But it was a, uh, it was a, a, a tour that lasted 12 months. And, uh, and I never went out with a team with more than about four men in the entire time I was there. Wow, I didn't realize that the teams were so small. Yeah, they, um, Battalion used to run larger teams, about 10, 12 men, and uh, and they'd get into trouble doing that. Uh, I, that's how I, how I got into trouble with that team down in with 1st Recon Battalion, because that was 18 men. So, you know, you're, you're talking about a group that's, that's, that's too large to stay clandestine and too small, really, to do anything once you get in a punch-up, and that's what happened to me. And it, it happened to Battalion teams a lot, but with force, you could go out there with three, maybe four men. Sometimes even smaller, two men, recon teams, and uh, it was rare that we ran into something. I mean, we would, 
we would. There's certainly, I mean, I certainly got hit a second time, but it was much rarer to get into contact with force than it was with battalion. And when you were with battalion is when you, you, you got shot really bad and had some of your intestines removed or was that was with force? <laughs> yeah, that was with battalion. Now that was uh, when I was on my first tour down in a place called uh, Tam Key Valley, which is outside Da Nang. And we, uh, we were sent out to look uh, at infiltration routes that were coming in from west of Da Nang because it was sort of a feeder alley. Uh, this Tam Key province was, and in particular, a place called Antenna Valley, which is, which is always a hot area. I mean, we got, <clears throat> we took a tremendous amount of ground fire just going in to our LZ. There must have been two or three hundred NBA and VC that were firing at us on the way in. So it wasn't like anybody didn't know we weren't there. And um, these rounds are coming right through the blades of the chopper, and it it, it occurred to me, you know, I was on my fourth trip and said, those bastards are really going to shoot. They're shooting at me. Now, why would they do that? Well, I never squared off against any of them. And then we got sniped at for about three hours until we lost ourselves in this really, really tall uh, elephant grass. And so uh, over the next two or three days, we had we had three contacts with NBA just walking right into us. So they didn't even know we were there, but there were so many down there that no matter where we set up, these NBA would just walk into our positions, and we were alert. It's not like we were doing a, you know, 50-50 uh, on off. We were 100% alert, and they came right into us. They were just, the place was crawling with NVA. And so it was really hard to stay clandestine. And by the, <clears throat> excuse me, the fourth day, we had enough. I mean, we'd been, we'd been hit three or four times. Uh, we called enough artillery in to disturb the area. They knew, I mean, they could pretty much track where we were by the, the way we were calling artillery in. Uh, with the, the patterns would shift, and of course you gotta shift an OP when you do that. So um, if you were smart, uh, you could track, pretty much track where this, our team was going from hill to hill to hill. And uh, so they set a, an a L-shaped ambush up for us on a trail going back down to the same LZ we came into. And, and this guy that was leading us was was not very good. He was a staff sergeant. Uh, our lieutenant had been killed two patrols before in a in a bad, bad contact, but we got overrun. Uh, but this sergeant, this staff sergeant, uh, had really no idea what he was doing. He'd been a former DI over in um, in, uh, San, in uh, San Diego, and he'd been with the MPs, and he was just out of his league. And I'm not sure. I think the lieutenant had brought him with him from the MPs, but he was just he was way, way in over his head, and he collapsed, I mean, in a little ball as we were going down the hill. <clears throat> and uh, a corporal had to take over the team of 18 men. This is what I liked about the Marines. You could give that command to guys that were just junior NCOs, and they could lead you in contacts like this. And, I mean, this is a bad scene. We we were probably surrounded by over 100 NBA. Uh, we lost one chopper already coming in to pick us up. Uh, the choppers, the other choppers that came in were taking heavy ground fire and uh, it was all they could do to get us who had been wounded there were four or five of us up through these trees with these air sea rescue hoists, you know, the kind they used to pick up down pilots in the in the ocean and uh, because it was triple canopy so they had to lower these things down and here you are, they're, they're, these are all the H-34s, you know, they're, they're just Korean War vintage choppers and they're clunking and rattling and heaving and spitting oil out and, and it just you wonder how they're staying afloat up there <clears throat> and they pull us up through these 30 foot hoists through these trees and the whole nba army it seems like was tagging us with with rounds i mean it's just they took hit after hit after hit with these choppers and those old birds just stayed there spewing out uh hydraulic fluid and all kinds of stuff but they got us up and finally got us to uh, back to Da Nang. And then uh, these four guys that were left down there um, took a huge crate of uh, C4 that we'd taken along with us. We were going out there to blow a bridge, but we never got to it. And put all their equipment on top of this pile of C4 and put a, a five-minute delay under it. 
and then just took off running and actually made it through the NBA lines and ran down to this pad, this uh, rice paddy where a chopper was waiting. And as they left, about 75 or 80 NBA converged on this big pile of equipment. I mean, this is this is big stuff to them. This is this is brand new equipment they were going to get. And it just blew, and it blew a mushroom-shaped cloud right through those trees. And uh, one of the uh, bird dog pilots up there said, you could just see bodies going right up skyward. Said it was the damnedest thing he'd ever seen. But these guys made it, made it finally to the chopper. And it was, as they were running, it was something right out of a, 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 a like a Steven Spielberg movie. I mean, you could see these, these uh, bullets. Bullets hit the, the water, I guess, and the, the, the water was spewing up right behind them. And those guys just made it onto that chopper before uh, the NBA started running out, trying to overrun the chopper. And they just got out of there. It was a hairy scene. Uh, but I got out, luckily. I got out relatively early in that. and uh, But I did get hit. Uh, I did get hit, shot three times. And, um, and uh, when I finally got to Da Nang, uh, I mean, they had that emergency crew waiting for me right there, and I went into surgery about an hour later, and uh, they cut, boy, they cut me up, man, something bad, stomach, back, side, because those bullets went in and out, one went right through me, so they were, the surgeons were pretty busy, you know, I owe my life to them. Yes, I yeah. imagine you do. Now, something like that, would uh, the staff sergeant, you know, do you know if he got relieved or he anything did. like that? He did, Rich. Matter of fact, it's a good question. Yeah, he got, in fact, he got relieved on the spot. He said, I don't know what to do out here. And this colonel said, all right, you're gone. Your, your history, you're relieved. And said, who's your next in command? And he couldn't even answer that. So finally, this corporal came on and said, look, I'm the ranking member here, sir. And I said, all right, you're, you're platoon commander now. And so uh, this corporal organized the medevacs and uh organized the on call stuff we had some artillery coming in before the medevacs came in um we couldn't get fixed wing in there because it was too overcast but i mean it's right during the monsoons and so uh he got everything sorted out this kid was uh, 20 21 years old imagine that taking on that kind of responsibility when you're that age i mean he had 15 men 16 men under his command half of them shot to pieces surrounded no way out taking fire from all kinds of sides. Uh, it was getting dark, and he had to organize all of this stuff. 21 years old. It, it, uh, I, I'm still amazed by the leadership qualities that, that these kids showed. Kids, you know, I was younger than that, but it always impressed me that these guys could think on their feet like that. But maybe they didn't finish high school, but where they had 10 tons of common sense. And uh, that's, what, that's what kept us alive, that, that sort of, that sort of balance and that sort of steel reserve and that kind of uh, presence of mind. I always admired that about the service. Army has some good, you know, they have the, they have good guys to do the same thing. They've shown that in Afghanistan and Iraq many, many times, but it was just personal experience of the Marines that showed me how these kids at this young age could show all these leadership qualities. Yeah. Thomas yeah, Ricks, Thomas who wrote Rick. the book, uh, Making the Corps, which is an excellent book. He talks about, and the, the impetus for him wanting to write the book was he was assigned by, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, I can't remember, in 1993. He's in Mogadishu going on the patrol. He's like, okay, where's the patrol leader? And they're like, that corporal right there. And he was 21. And he said, uh, this guy's in charge of my life, my safety, going through Mogadishu. <laughs> and, they're, and they're like, that's right. And, and, uh, he's, and he literally said... In our office, we wouldn't let a 21-year-old use the copy machine. And, yet, <laughs> and he's like, where do they make such men that have, like you said, those qualities you just laid out, John, the presence of mind, the common sense, the, the, um, the intellectual reserves, and the ability to think in three dimensions to control artillery and think, I need to blow this equipment. I need to designate an alternate LZ to get my folks out of here. The, the poise and presence of mind under fire to make it happen. I mean, my God, you know, how do we do that? Yeah, I, I, uh, I always liked that, that part about the Marines. Uh, and these guys, some of them went to NCO leadership school and some of them didn't. They just didn't have a chance to in Vietnam. Uh, and some of them had gone back through that in force training when they were back in the States. But 
it was an element of time in, in Vietnam where they didn't have a chance to go through that same sort of schooling. And these were innate qualities that they'd sort of picked up. Now, I guarantee you, the, the kid was on this, his second tour, and he picked up a lot from the first tour, obviously. And he wasn't in that kind of position. I think he was a Lance Jack uh, that first time around. But as a corporal, uh, it, it, it just seemed like he was automatic in there. And in fact, the funny thing was, he outranked the sergeant because the sergeant was relatively newly assigned to our unit. And this corporal took over from the sergeant because he had more bush time. And um, Sergeant had no problem with that at all. He'd been, a, in fact, he'd been a cop, and he became a cop down at Virginia Beach after the war. And uh, I, I knew him really well. He's a good guy, but he was junior, and he deferred to this corporal, who uh, who just took over, took over an eighteen man team, and uh, did all that on his own. Didn't ask any. I mean, he asked for advice, as you know, that's what a good leader does. But he made all his decisions himself, and he just. Just one, two, three. I need to do this, 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 and this, and this, and so on. And it was uh, it was really impressive. Now, I was in the back of the team at the time I got hit, so I didn't see all this going on down there. I just heard about it later. But, I mean, he saved everybody's life, to, to include the fact that he blew the, the guy that shot me. He blew him right out of a tree with a 12-gauge pump. So that was nice, too. Added touch there. So I was always grateful to him for that. That was mighty nice of him. Appreciate that. That was nice of him. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to thank you from behalf of Coffee with Rich that uh, you allowed Dr. Cronin to be here this morning. Yeah. Uh, well, he, he's a uh, he is a mechanic. He was a, uh, a diesel became a diesel mechanic, lead diesel mechanic for a trucking firm down in Florida after the war, and uh, just a good guy. Uh, drank beer with his friends on Friday. I saw him about 10 years ago at a reunion and he was just a good old boy, you know, and, uh, same, same guy I knew when he was 20 years old and just, you know, a little older, but he was, uh, he, he just came across the same kind of guy, unassuming. And, uh, he wouldn't at, talk about this stuff unless you ask him like, like you do. And, uh, it, it was just interesting getting to see him after all those years. You know what I love about that? And I think it's a strength of America that when the nation calls men and women step up, they shoulder their rifle, they go do their thing. And then they come back and become butchers and bakers and candlestick makers and whatever our economy needs. And they raise their families and go about their business. I, I just love that story. Yeah, it was wonderful. Uh, the best team leader I ever had uh, was a, became a long haul trucker after the war out of Arizona. And um, uh, I talked to him at the same reunion and uh, had nothing more he liked to do than get in that truck and just start driving. He drove all over the country and he was just a good guy, but boy, that guy could operate in Vietnam. He was really hardcore. And uh, the other one who was superb came over from Fox 2-3, uh, extended his tour and, and uh, from the infantry and said, I want to go to force. And so, they put him over there because he had all this bush experience and he ended up with Raytheon um, and turned out to have a really, really good career. Um, went back to college after the war. And that's what these guys do. You know, they make their lives back after they, uh, they finish just like you did. You know, I mean, you were, you were over in uh, the middle East uh, a couple of tours and uh, you came back and you became a badass. you know? I don't know about that, John. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, I, I just absolutely love that. And I think that's the strength of our nation is those the, the ability to do that. I want to talk to you about, let, let's so you had to fight to stay in the Marine Corps after you were wounded. Uh, somehow you get your way back to Vietnam. You get into third force reconnaissance, uh, a, a absolutely legendary unit in Vietnam. And then within three hours of getting there, they tell you, shoulder your ruck and we're going out, right? Yeah. They, uh, they sent us out to a place called the Horseshoe, which was a, uh, if you look at a map in Vietnam and, and, and uh, sort of like a one to 50,000 sheet, you'll see it, it loops in from Laos into Vietnam. It's like a, it's like a big, you know, the border comes down and then it bends into Vietnam and then out again. And it looked exactly like a horseshoe. And this was a major infiltration route from the NBA into Northern i -Corps. They came in from Laos. Now, they weren't using DMZ much in those days because we had already saturated it. I mean, we had 100,000 Marines up in, north, up in the northern part of I-Corps, 
and we sort of cut off the infiltration route through the north through the uh, demilitarized zone. So they skirted around into Laos through the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and then and then went down Laos about forty miles, and then flipped up into this loop into South Vietnam. So there was always activity in the horseshoe, and they used to put anti-recon units in these in these uh, LZs where they position about eight or ten men on a rotating basis and they would sit around these LZs, these likely LZs, because they knew we had to go into the horseshoe. It was such a, a high impact area. And so they would keep these rotating groups down there hidden, let these choppers get in, let them unload their teams, and then all hell would break loose. And so what they do is they catch the choppers on the way up and they catch the men on the ground and the guys hadn't even had time to disperse yet they were still in a group there in the lz's and these anti-recon teams would just go to it so you had to be really really careful going into an lz in the horseshoe and i went there three times and i got shot out all three times because the gunships would lead you in by about a k ahead of the uh, troop carriers the uh, the slicks and invariably one of those door gunners would be looking out the door and he'd see something moving down there just one guy and he'd throw this red smoke and once that red smoke went out the nba down there knew that they'd been busted and so the esh would hit the fan and you'd get all of this ground fire coming up from these lz's and sometimes you'd be four five six seven hundred meters out from where the gunships were and there'd be guys firing at you 500 meters out, that's how many of them there were. Not just in the LZ, but a half a K out, you were taking ground fire. There, there were hundreds of them down there. And they expected a four-man... <laughs> they expected these four-man teams to go down there and and say, okay, let's go find the NVA. You didn't have a problem with finding the NVA, man. They found you, and they found you in about three seconds flat. So... It's not you had we had a bunch of chickens in force, but when you got on the uh, when you got the warning order that you were going into the horseshoe, you just had to shake your head and say, "Oh Christ, I hope I get shot out because I do not want to be on the ground and then have those choppers pull out and then leave us down there." Uh, and I mean, I knew eight, uh, 10, 15 guys who had that problem, and they they said it was the worst. Those were the worst patrols they'd ever been on because they just knew that they'd going to be surrounded if the choppers got out of there. And they were. And you had to get the infantry in and artillery. You had to run airstrikes. Oh, it was a, it was terrible. And that's what you had to look for. About once a month, you got rotated in to go into and get dropped into the horseshoe. And on my three tri trips down there, we never even made it a K in towards the LZ before we took ground fire. And... Uh, it, you know, we didn't wear helmets, so we couldn't sit on our helmets on those choppers. So we just had to sit on our packs and hope nothing came through the floorboards. But it was, and they'd be running down there, and they'd be dragging uh, 75 uh, recoilless rifles, millimeter recoilless rifles, right behind them. I mean, it's not like they were lightly armed, Rich. You know, these guys were ready for action down there. They had RPGs, and they'd shoot these RPGs, and you'd see this stream of, of uh, flame coming right toward you, and it the choppers were sitting ducks. Now, why we didn't get more shot down is beyond me, because they were just firing dozens of RPGs from the ground. Um, so it, it was a they had they had a they had a small army in in the horseshoe, just waiting for us. So it was a it was a terrible terrible scene to get assigned there. Uh, you, you're muted, my friend. Always, there I'm go. always doing it. <laughs> what I was going to say, John, is, you know, nowadays, if you come in and the LZ's hot like that and the element of surprise is gone, why would you insert a four man reconnaissance team? I mean, today we would say we're not we're not, you know, we're going to find some other means of infiltration. But this one's blown. But back then they're like, nah, you know, we're still going to let you go in there and try to find these guys. What do you mean? Try to find them. They're right here. Yeah. <laughs> no, there was no question there. They, then they started uh, thinking, well, let's drop them out. 10 Ks from the, uh, from the horseshoe and let them walk in. But the problem is the NBA figured that out too. And so they started putting these anti-recon teams two and three and four and five Ks out. 
and and put in, there were, had so many NBA there that they could afford to do that. And so they'd stake out these LZs that were two and three and four Ks from the horseshoe itself. So I never did get in there. I know all I did was see it from the uh, from the air down, but I never got it from the ground up. And um, half the guys I knew never got in there at all. They wow. ever, they just kept getting shot out. And the ones who did just had the they probably had the hairiest stories of survival of anybody I ever knew in Vietnam getting in there and getting out with their lives. Because, man, if they ever got on the ground, they were running for their lives. And I mean just running. And sometimes they just have to dump their equipment, shoot up the, uh, shoot up everything, keep your radio, but shoot everything up and, and run almost equipment free with just their web gear just to get out of there alive. It was, it was just dreadful. That, that horseshoe was terrible. You know, there, it's, it's such an interesting thing we're ha- talking about, John, because uh, I was reading a book, The Mission, The Men, and Me by, by Pete Bleber, a retired Delta Force officer, and he's he's agreed to come on the show. So I'm looking forward to, to talking to him because he said when he was going to college and you know wanting to become an Army officer, uh, one of his professors was a former Vietnam vet, and he said, yeah, you know, my history class is going to take us to uh, Gettysburg. I don't know if it's, I don't know if I want to go. I don't know if there's any lessons to be learned there. And the, um, the history professor who's a Vietnam vet said, everything you need to know about Vietnam, you can learn at Gettysburg. And his takeaway after he went to Gettysburg was that the, the failure of the uh, officer leadership to allow, like, let's say Pickett's charge should have never happened. You just threw your men's lives away. And I kind of, and I kind of think that as an officer, why in the hell were you letting these young men throw their lives away in that horseshoe when there's got to be a better way to get the necessary intelligence than just going, yeah, we're going to drop you in there. Good, good luck. I just don't, I don't understand that. Am I missing something? No, you're not, buddy. You, you certainly aren't. Um, and it took, it took probably half the tour from my getting there in mid-68 to early 69 for a battalion to figure that out. And then finally, by the early 69 period, they said there's just no point in putting people in there, at least even trying to put people in there. So they just went to air reconnaissance from that point on. But uh, up to that, and I mean right from 67 onward, uh, when that became a big deal that Horseshoe did, they were trying to they were trying to put guys in. It was kind of like Rich. It was kind of like being with 26 Marines up to Quezon and during Tet. You had 40,000 NBA outside of that base at Quezon in the hills. Imagine that. That's like two full divisions out there. And they still sent recon teams outside the wire to look at that and see what they could find. And I thought, holy. And, you know, I talked to these guys today. I was, I'd, I'd been hit by that time. I was in the hospital in the Philippines. But the droves of men coming in in the hospital, in my wards, who were who had been hit around Quezon was unbelievable. And some of these guys were recon guys. And you'd think, holy moly, why would you send a team outside the wire? And they'd only make it about two, 300 meters before they'd get hit. Who are you trying to find? You know they're out there. And it was, it was, it was insane. And finally, finally, um, I can't remember his name. He was assistant commandant of the Marines. He was a good, oh, Walt, Lou Walt said, no, nah, this is BS. We're not doing this anymore. We know where they are. We're, we don't send those teams out there. There's a very famous photograph of a, of a infantry platoon that got sent out uh, probably 25 men or so, and they were going out on the northern part of the wire. <clears throat> and they get out there about, 300 meters and just get the living hell shot out of them. And the photograph that this, that this photographer takes is of this Lieutenant being pulled back in and he's got this huge blood patch on his stomach and his eyes are half closed. He's already dead. And his men are pulling him back in and he lost about 10 men out of that patrol of a, of a platoon. And this, this photograph won a Pulitzer prize because it was, it was graphic as hell. You could see the, the, the absolute shock on the, on the Marines' faces who were pulling this guy back. And his head is dropped back and his mouth is open and he's got blood coming out. And the ironic part about this whole thing is the photographer himself got killed 
with the Marines at Quezon, not just two weeks later, I think it was, same guy. But that's what happened when you sent these guys outside the wire. I don't know what they thought they were trying to find. Now, I can understand when they went up 881 north and south. Now, those are the two hills that were overlooking Quezon, and the NBA were up there, and they were just pumping the Marines down there with mortars and, uh, and small arms fire and so on. So I can understand going up there and trying to clear those hills off. That, that made a lot of sense. And they lost some people up there, but they did clear those hills. And so good for them. But going outside the wire up into the other hills that were just solidly packed with NBA was absolutely pointless. And finally, Walt said, no, we're not doing this anymore. This is insane. So they stopped that nonsense uh, right after uh, about the middle of Tet. And um, kept the well, that kind of leadership. <laughs> that kind of leadership takes a lot of courage to 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 stop that. I mean, we unless you're in the military, you may not understand the courage it takes to go. Now nah, we're we're not doing that anymore, and and to take all the pressure from everybody above you. That's like, what do you mean you're not you're not you're not going there anymore? That's I'm not throwing my men's lives away. That's ridiculous. It, that's right. Well, Walt was a four star general. He was assistant commandant of the Marine Corps, and incredible enough. He took the lead in one of the assaults going up 881 North. He had a wow. four-star general up there, and he said, all right, let's go. You follow me. And these guys from the 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marine said, are you kidding me? And he, he got a flak jacket and helmet on and said, one of those classic follow me. You know, that's the 2nd Marine Division uh, motto. And um, off they went. And um, I think he got hit during that uh, assault. But uh, the guy that I later that later joined Force Recon came from Fox 23, and he said he was about 20 feet, 30 feet behind Walt. He said he couldn't believe this guy. He couldn't believe that you'd have a senior officer up there taking rounds and dodging stuff coming out of these uh, little fire pits and, uh, and uh, holes and things like that in the ground. He just took him right up to the top. That was the damnest thing he'd ever seen in his life. So, uh, you know, you get these guys that uh, don't know how to say no. They just, you know, they just lead. They're, they're, they're leaders, you know, Rich. You know what I mean? They're just born leaders. Yeah, and I uh, I want to talk to you about, and I, I kind of wanted to talk to you about this, John, and, and the fact that you said, you know, you get there and three hours later you're going on a mission because I wanted to ask you, Back then, what was mission prep like? You know, did you have terrain models, warning orders, inspections, test fire your weapons? What what was all that stuff like that led into the mission? You'd get a warning order uh, the day before. Uh, usually between patrols, we had three days off. So they give you the, the first day you, you were done. You had nothing to do. You were, you were you know, 24 hours and that was all to yourself. Get your clothes clean, go to the PX and, and, and whatever. Uh, the second day, you'd get a warning order, uh, and it would show you a terrain layout. You'd go up to the S2, at uh, company S2, and he would give you a 1 to 50 briefing on uh, on the terrain and where the water was going to be and, and blah, blah, blah. And then the third day, you would get uh, all your Cs, or you'd get the uh, long rats if they, were, if they were in. It was during the monsoon. They'd bring these long rations, which are... You just add water to them. They were pretty good. Uh, and you would get your, <clears throat> you'd pick up your ammo, pick up your grenades and uh, whatever from the armory. Uh, and you could go out and fan fire your weapon if you wanted to. There's a little range out there. Uh, and you'd check all your equipment. And then on the morning of the fourth day, you'd usually be out on the pad about 6.30. And uh, if it was raining pretty hard, I mean, you'd, you'd stay in a hooch nearby and wait for a break. They always managed to get you out there during the monsoons. They'd always find a way to get you out there. But boy, trying to get you back in during the monsoons, you could go out, go out for five and end up staying for eight. And so you really had to ration your food if you were dropped in during the monsoons because they they wouldn't make that a number one priority to get you back in. Uh, that was just the name of the game, and you sort of expected that. So uh, uh, you hope for the best. Hope that you just got rained out and. Uh, you know, you could go when it was sunny, but uh, that's how the that's how they usually ran it. And the same with battalion; they uh, they always give you three days off, and the second and third day you got kind of busy. Uh, you muted yourself again, buddy. John, I, I tell you yeah. what, I, 
I don't know what's wrong with me this morning. I didn't get enough coffee. <laughs> so that's good. I, I didn't realize there was that level of detail. I, I'm, I like that. I like that. Um, when it comes to the, did you guys use Marine helos or Army helos at Third Force? Uh, that's another good question. Um, we used Army helos probably half the time. They came over from the First Air Cav. And uh, they were really anxious to help us. These pilots were just chucked as they could be to be out there. These were all warrant officers. They were like 19, 20 years old. They'd been through warrant officer school down in Alabama, I think it was. One of those trained schools down there. And they came over as, uh, as junior warrant officers and were, uh, as I said, they were our age. They were 20 years old. And they were just happy as they could be to take us out and bring us back in. And uh, I was up near Quezon one time, and uh, four or five slicks, two gunships, uh, two Cobras, and about four or five slicks came by about 2,000 feet. And then on my – I was a radio operator, of course, and on my channel it said, uh, uh, Blue Plate, this is Scarface 1-2. And I'd never heard that call sign before. And I said, okay, go ahead. Who's this, please? And he said, well, we're the guys right above you. Uh, they knew our location. I'm, I'm not sure how the Army got that. But uh, this guy was a, an Air Cav uh, team. They just dropped some of their guys uh, north of us. And they said, look, we're in the area. Uh, you need any help? And I said, well, you know, the funny thing is we just saw about 25 NVA, uh, a K north of us, which would put them probably near you. I said, just stop, hold fire, hold fire, hold fire. And damn, if they didn't go in and they smoked the living hell out of these NVA that we had just seen. They were having a ball up there. Uh, the slick stayed away. They just sort of circled about a K, two Ks out. And these gunships just went to town. Um, and had a, I'm sure had a wonderful time. Shot the whole area up, you know, blew the jungle away. And uh, there was no way they could confirm how many they got. But we went in later on, a, on a, an assessment and they ended up uh, clocking eight. Wow. Right on the ground. And, um, and they said, yeah, well, yeah, I think we finished for the day. I don't want to see any more. But uh, listen, if you need us again, you give us a call. We're down not far away. And they were, it was the funniest thing I ever saw. Uh, and they just went right on back to their, uh, they were back at Quang Tree also. So they just went right back to their pad. But it, they drop us too. They pick us up and drop us. They, uh, they, they were very, Army was very, very good about lending their people to help us, uh, you know, get in and out of our, uh, of our LZs. I had heard that about the, uh, the army's pilots that were supporting the Marines, the uh, third force reconnaissance Marines. Uh, it's interesting to hear your, your personal experience with that as well. So that I was told correctly and, uh, Marine aviation then, and potentially now don't always have the best, uh, reputation. Uh, the, not to say they're not brave and capable, but, Sometimes there are some uh, helicopter squadron commanders that forget their mission of support and not to just to take care of the helos. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, the uh, Army was great. We'd, we'd get off the pad and uh, we'd walk away, and I'd always wave to the – I was the last guy off the chopper, and I always wave to the, uh, the pilot and thank him. You know, I'd always wave back, and uh, uh, before we got down on the headset, they'd say, hey, look, uh, I'm telling you, we're, we're, right, we're right next door. You let me know if you need anything. Well, hell, I was a corporal. I'm not going to be, be able to give them a call. But he meant that for the battalion, and they were good for their word. That uh, those guys were just first class. Those Army chopper pilots. I mean, I have all the time in the world for them. Um, we didn't operate with them on the ground, but uh, they were certainly great with their support. I want to ask you another question, John. Shifting gears. So, um, you know, I think a lot of Americans of my generation. We've heard the stories of American service members being sped upon and when they returned home. And what was that climate like when you returned home from Vietnam? You know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I got home and the really at the height of the anti-war period, which was in uh, mid-69. And uh, I landed at National Airport in D.C. And honestly, I, I had people treat me really, really well. They were uh, they could have been nicer. I never had one person come up to me and spit on me or, or try to pull my ribbons off or go through any of that nonsense that, that some guys had reported. Uh, people just couldn't have been nicer or they'd just ignore me. I mean, you could tell that, you know, they were 
from the other side. I mean, they had, you know, flowers all over them and long hair. And, you know, they were playing tambourines and walking around in saffron gowns and that sort of stuff. So obviously they're not going to be on my side. And, and, uh, and uh, I had one of them come up to me after I got back and said that uh, it was a woman. She said that she loved me. And I, you know, <laughs> okay. But she said, I'm, I'm not crazy about what you just did over there. But I want you to know that I love you. Now she was about forty-five years old, and here I am, twenty-three, and uh, and she was uh, part of this this peace movement, and she stuck this flower behind uh, the ribbons, and um, uh, she wanted me to come to a meeting uh, of her people uh, that was being held in Georgetown the next day, and she said maybe it'll t it'll tell you that you've been you've been on the wrong side of things, and I said no, no, lady, I was on the right side of things. Uh, but that is the only, if you call it a confrontation, that's the only one I ever had during the entire time I was back, even between tours. I did get in a fight with a guy. I will say this. I got in a bar fight with a guy uh, between tours. Uh, I'd, I'd forgotten that. I was uh, down at BMI down in Lexington, and um, I've been invited by the guys that I'd been to school with there for a year to come back in for the midwinter dances. So I'd gone down with my sister, who had a date with a first classman, and uh, this guy from Washington Lee University approached me in a bar. I was in uniform, and he, he gave me a hard time, you know, baby killer and all that. And so we ended up going out in the alley and stroking it out. And uh, I broke the guy's nose. I broke my hand in the, in the process. But the funny thing was, I got back into the bar, and this guy comes crawling back in, just blood all over the place. And somebody called the cops, and the cops came in took a look at me, took one look at him, didn't say a word, picked him up by the scruff of his neck and put him in handcuffs, and then took him back out to the car and locked him and locked him away. But nobody ever said one word to me. The cops just, one guy just sort of nodded, and then off they went. But they understood that this guy had given me a hard time and that all I was doing was defending myself, and so they let it go. But that was, I... I, I I prefaced this by saying I never had a problem. It was one. It was the one issue I did have, but it lasted about five minutes, and then it was all over. And the rest of the bar was very sympathetic to uh, you know to what happened. They knew the guy was drunk, and uh, they said just, you know no reason to be messing with a marine. Uh, plus, the marine just smoked him, so you, you know just leave him alone. I like that story. Things, yeah, but other than that, uh, I got along. I got. I, I really had no problems with people after the war. So after, you know, after your time as an enlisted Marine, as we mentioned in your bio, you go to the Citadel, you earn your bachelor's, you take a commission as a second lieutenant of Marines, go to the basic school, infantry officer's course, you get assigned to Lejeune, correct? I'm down at uh, Camp Swampy. That's right. Lovely oh, place. Oh, Camp Swampy. I spent mm -hmm. six years there myself. <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about John. I heard stories, you know, in my day in the late eighties, early nineties, as a young enlisted Marine stories about the early seventies at Lejeune. And there was a lot of racial tension. Is that much ado about nothing or was that a real thing? No, that was, uh, that actually did happen. There was some, there were some racial problems down there at the time. And, um, it, there was no way to get around it. I mean, the, the country had been, had been set in that course with the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King back in April of 68. And it still hadn't resolved itself by the early 70s. I was a, I was officer of the day one time when I was with the uh, 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines. And I came in, I was, I was touring the battalion area, and I came into a hooch one time, and there must have been 50 or 60 black Marines in there. And they were part of a group that they called themselves the Mau Mau's after the uh, Kenyan guerrillas in the, in, uh, in the 50s. And, uh, of course, the conversation stopped dead on the spot when I walked through the door. And I got some pretty hard looks in there, but I noticed there were about three or four guys from my company. And, uh, and I spoke to these guys just like the men that they were. I said, look, you know, uh, I can appreciate the issues that you've got, and you've got every right to be upset about tensions in country itself. If you're not being mistreated in the Marines, nobody's discriminating against you in the service. And you've got to be honest about that. 
and I know because I'm a platoon commander and I know some of you guys already and I heard some murmuring and so on and uh, and I left I came back about two hours later and they were still there and one of them came up to me and said yeah you know lieutenant you're right you know we, we've got no beef with the Marines uh, they, they've never been anything but you know fair with us but we got some problems once we get outside and I said I, I can hear you man I can hear you that was it was a it was a very very tense environment in the country that's when the black panthers became extremely active uh symbionese symbionese liberation army was active at the time with patty hearst uh, and you had some real real problems in that country nothing compared i mean there were what we have today is is minor compared to what it was like back in those days and so you know i lived with that for four years as a as an officer three back then and uh, i got along really well with the uh, with the the black marines in my company because i told them i was going to put them all in jail and uh you know or when we went on a float i said they're going to throw them all overboard because they look like shark bait to me and uh, as long as i could keep those guys half amused you know i had them on my side so that was what they just wanted to be treated the same as everybody else that's all and uh, I guess they had a bad deal once they were outside the gates. But once they were inside the gates, you know, I said, you know, that nobody's discriminating against you. So I hope I got through to a few of them that way. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I speak for my 23 years in service. I, some of the finest Marines I ever served with were African-American Marines. Uh, just absolutely top shelf. And But that doesn't mean that, you know, everything was peaches and cream in my time in 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines. You know, in 1992, right before we went on a float, it's so funny you say that this a group of African-American Marines got together and called themselves the Mau Mau in in Tutu. When I was in Tutu, a group of African-Americans got, Marines got together and called themselves the X-Men. I believe the Spike Lee movie um, about Malcolm X had came out. His His autobiography was out and they were reading this and got really upset and decided to do something about it. They were gonna kill a white guy. So they um, found a Lance Corporal by himself, shot him in the face with a shotgun. They killed another Marine and NCIS uh, busted him. And now several of them are sitting, here we are 20 years later on death row at Leavenworth. You can you can look it up if you don't believe me. The really? names were, uh-huh. yeah. Parker, mm-hmm. Washington and McDonald. I believe uh, Parker, who was the shooter and Washington are still on death row. Wow. But yeah, I knew all, I knew all those guys, and they just wanted to kill uh, kill a white guy to get back at uh, whatever perceived injustice. So the military has its problems, and uh, I mean we're we're just a cross segment of society. Would you agree with that, John? Oh, no question about it. Um, the uh, that's what the service had always prided itself on is the fact that you could find people from every sort of uh, socio economic dimension in the service. Now, true. They, the service has always built itself up around the lower, lower middle class. And I say that on an economic standpoint, not from a social standpoint, from an economic standpoint. They've always drawn heavily from that group of individuals because these are the guys that sometimes are a little aimless and they, they are almost homeless and they need some direction. And so they've usually filled the ranks. But more and more now, see, in those days, as you well know, Rich, uh, you, you, a lot of guys could get in without a high school education. Uh, and some guys had records and they were, they were allowed in. They don't do that anymore. I mean, you're screened before you come in. You've got to have at least a high school degree and you can't have a, you can't have a record, at least to my knowledge, before you're allowed in. And that cut out a lot of the problems after, after Vietnam. Um, they had a lot of end of monthers there, which were these guys or these recruiters that had not met their quotas. And so they, they deferred their, their, uh, the, the last two or three guys that they wouldn't take on a, not on a bet, but they had to fill a quota and they bring these guys in and they were basically transferring a criminal from the civilian side to the Marines. And we were getting their problems. And God, there were some guys that were just unbelievably bad. I mean, these were felons who were now in uniform. Um, but those days are long gone. They just don't, they, I mean, you had your X-Men thing, but I think that's more of a rarity than you have uh certainly any, uh, in any capacity uh, now, but in, yeah, back in the, back in the seventies, uh, there were some, there were some issues that we had to deal with. 
Well, and if you think back to that time, this is 1992, the the uh, Rodney King incident happened in 91. So the aftermath of that is just going through. So these guys got, I'm, I'm assuming, got swept up in the moment and perceived some injustice, which weren't there. But the problem it created for the battalion, as you might imagine, these uh, African-American Marines were all in the communications platoon. And so we'd lose all of them to the trial and to prison. And now we're scrambling to make, to get enough calm guys together to make the float. So of course for our, our float, we had a lot of calm problems because we just did not have yeah. a full platoon. But aside from that, uh, I, I want to ask you, so what was the final straw? You were, a, you're an officer at Lejeune, you know, you've been in the Marines for quite some time now. What was the final straw that, that made you say, you know what, I'm done with this. Let me, uh, you know, surrender my commission and I'm going to sub-Saharan Africa. What was it? <laughs> Honestly, Rich, it was the fact that I was no longer in, in a, an operational situation. I'd, uh, I'd taken an infantry MOS in 0203 or 0302, excuse me. And, uh, and I was with the uh, Echo 22, and it was a, it was nice. I had a great company commander, Frank Neubauer. It was a good battalion, Colonel Cook, uh, Ernie Cook, who later became Lieutenant General. I mean, it, it, it had the best officers you can imagine. So I never had a problem with that. But I wasn't doing anything. I was going out four days a week out there with the damn chiggers and uh and uh scorpions and uh insects made my life miserable out of swampy just miserable yep. and i thought god man i i'm not i don't want to do this for the next three years four days out one day back four days out you know a couple of days back so i thought i'd, I'd gotten sent down to guantanamo bay and then i went up to division and i thought no this ain't gonna make it i'm i'm a senior first lieutenant i was i've been offered uh uh, two companies, two infantry companies to take over as lieutenant, which was nice. And I'd have made captain right off the bat. And I thought, boy, that's a, that's not a bad way to start your career at 23, at 24, or I was 25 then. I thought, that's, you know, captain 25. I'll, but I thought, geez, man, I got more of this stuff because I was going to be headed out on another float. As you just mentioned, this was a med tour. So that was a six month job. Now, so I put my papers in. And in 76, I said, there's another war going on. I think I'll be really stupid. And I'll go to this war because I already finished one war and I didn't manage to get myself killed over there. But maybe I can do that over in Africa because I'll have plenty of opportunity to get shot to pieces there. And so that's what I did. I went to Rhodesia in 76 and uh, interviewed with their their people had an 11 man commission that uh, interviewed me when I got there and they asked me a lot of technical questions. You know, all right, you're an officer, you're in this situation, uh, you're surrounded here, you got people coming, what are you going to do with this, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so we went through about an hour of that, of what ifs. And um, I finally got their imprimatur and they said, okay, we'll bring you in and uh, make you first lieutenant, same rank you were. So where do you want to go? You can go to the Special Air Service, but I'd already done a lot of that with Force Recon, and I thought, well, I'll do something different. Or we can put you with the Rhodesia Light Infantry, which does a lot of Fire Force stuff. And this, I said, well, that, that rings a bell. So I took the RLI, and I got commissioned into one of the commandos there, one of the three operational commandos, and went to jump school and, uh, and started on Fire Force for two years. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I, if you're going to go back and watch the first show we did with Dr. Cronin, we talk a lot about his time in Rhodesia. And I do have a few questions specific to Rhodesia. But before I get there, good morning, Gal in the Philippines. Uh, he says, good morning, Rich. Good morning, John. Good morning, guys. Sorry I'm late. I'm actually at work. Well, Gal, I'm thankful that you're taking a moment to uh, hang out with us. Tony, another former Marine, says, Rich, what float were you on in 1992? I was. I did a med with 26 Marines. And... Um, Another interesting thing about the X-Men group that are now uh, sitting in Leavenworth on uh, death row. So um, I'm on radio watch uh, Parker, the, the guy that ended up killing a bunch of other Marines. At, so this is 1991, a year before he, he goes on his killing spree and he's supposed to old Lance Corporal Brown is supposed to wake up Parker for the next radio watch shift. And we're in the middle of nowhere, John in the desert. 
And I go over to old Parker and he's laying there in a the sleeping bag and I kind of nudge him. I'm like, Hey pal, yeah, you're on radio watch, man. You got 15 minutes. So I'm sitting there listening to the static, you know, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for 15 minutes. And then I, I, I he doesn't show up. I, he's laying there in his bag. I go over there and I, I kick him again. I'm like, Hey man, your shift let's go. And he doesn't move. And I, I get a little bit more rough with my kicking of him. And he rolls out of that bag, John, and points his weapon at me. He's So he's, we're in combat. He's locked and loaded. He points his damn M16 at me. And I'm like, hey, so I level down with mine. I'm like, you need to get your, stop pointing your freaking weapon at me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had this little tent standoff there for a minute um, right before radio. He went on radio watch, and he grudgingly got out, didn't say a word, did his shift. And we never spoke of it again. But a year later, he's out killing white people. <laughs> So I always thought, I wonder if I was on the hit parade of this guy. Yeah, he, uh, this guy probably had an issue before he joined the Marines. He probably had a chip on his shoulder a mile high. And uh, this is one good way to uh, get somebody to knock it off. He was just waiting for somebody to knock it off. And you could have been the guy, Rich, you know, you never know if you pushed it. You know, it's uh, people like that are just unpredictable. I had a guy like that in my battalion who, uh, who was uh, he pulled a he pulled a weapon on me uh, during uh, um, when I was lost through the day and I went down in the mess hall. It was a it was a it was a civilian weapon. Guy that pulled a thirty eight on me in the mess hall and I had a forty five and I just leveled it at him and I said, okay, you know, you call the shots. And finally, the MPs got there. Uh, so it was, you know, I was a, this white, you know devil and so on but he was part of that Mau Mau group and and uh he ended up getting locked away i mean you point a weapon at an officer that's assault i think he got six six and a kick on that one yeah and, and if you don't know what six 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 and a kick is they also call it a, a big chicken dinner a, a bad conduct discharge six months confinement six months forfeiture of paying allowances and uh and kicked out so yeah and and that's exactly what he deserved for that mm -hmm. Tony says he was with Inchon, on the Inchon with 24th Mew. And uh, Gregory is on. Good morning, brother. Gregory, I need you on the show, man. He is American Warrior Society member in 1928. He's got a pretty storied career in the Marines as well. Thank you to the 13 folks that are still sure. watching, John and I. Uh, John, I want to talk to you. So take us back. What was, when you arrived in Rhodesia, what was Salisbury like? It was, was it a modern city? I mean, what was it like? You know, it was a nice place to be. It was a uh, uh, very placid uh, part of the uh, part of Africa. Um, you had no racial tensions, whatever, in the town itself. Uh, people got along quite well, blacks and whites. Um, uh, you had restaurants there that you know, would serve an American fare. You had bookstores, uh, uh, regular department stores. I mean, it was a very easy, nice, easy way uh, of living with those uh, good restaurants, nice hotels, first class, five star hotels. Um, it was a, it was a, a, a very decent place to live. And it, it, it stayed that way for the entire time that I was in Rhodesia. Uh, and some of the big cities outside like Umtali on the Mozambique border and Bulawayo out in the West near the, uh, near Botswana, never had any real serious problems during the war, uh, from a security standpoint. So, uh, the cities were fine. The cities were, were very well uh, manicured. People were pleasant to one another. And I never I never carried a weapon in the city the entire time I was over there. Nobody did. Uh, it was just it wasn't that kind of place. Then. You get out in the bush now, things get a little dicey. But uh, internally, from uh, the urban standpoint, we didn't really have a problem. Let me ask you this question. In your, in your opinion, was Ian Smith, who was the prime minister of Rhodesia at the time, was he a capable leader in your summation? He had the right idea. Back in the early 60s, he actually wanted to make amends and bring black nationalists, moderate nationalists, into the government. But he was part of a group called the Rhodesia Front, and you had these right-wing hardcore white supremacists over there. And I mean, these were hardcore white supremacists who wouldn't allow him. And they had a strong enough faction in there to deny him a mandate to incorporate any moderate nationalist political activity into the Rhodesia Front Party. And so his hands were tied. And then finally, by the, by the late 70s, he said, 
oh, the hell with this. I'm going to try this again. So he got into secret talks with Joshua and Como, who led one of the factions, black nationalist factions that we were fighting. And he met secretly with him up at Victoria Falls, which is up in the Zambi, right along the Zambian border in 1978. And they were making a, an agreement, trying to reach an agreement to join forces and bring his army, his nationalist army, these called Zipra, in with Rhodesian army forces and eliminate Robert Mugabe and Zanla. This is how it was going to work. And once that army was eliminated by uh, Mugabe's army was eliminated, then Smith and Nkoma would reach this would reach this political agreement where they would start sharing power. And it was a very plausible approach that Smith took. But two of Nkoma's factions, two of his sections out in uh, Matabili land, shot down two Viscount passenger aircraft. They were un very undisciplined, a lot of these guys. And the first one went down, and uh, I think there were 15 or 20 survivors. And uh, they ended up, some of them got rescued. But the second one, everyone was killed. All the passengers were killed. Uh, the ones that survived on the ground were all shot by the zipper sections. And so that agreement between Nkomo and, and uh, Smith just fell right through the, 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 the floor with that. But there, they, there was a very, very good chance that, that Smith and Nkomo were going to reach an agreement in the late 70s. And, and Mugabe is going to be the odd man out. Was that a, the, the surface air missile that shot those two passenger airliners down? Was that Chinese made or Russian or what? It was, was a Russian. It was a, it was a Sam seven Estrella. And uh, it, it, it's interesting that I hit a camp. I was with the RLA and we hit a camp up in Zambia called Fira, which is right across the Zambezi river. And uh, we, I think we ended up killing something like 50 or 60 Zipra in that camp. I lost a man in that too, uh, an American kid by the name of Frank Battaglia got killed. But I came across with four of my men, I came across this box of what I thought were RPGs. And we took the top off and they were these Strela missiles. We'd never seen them before. And I reported this up and, you know, code this up and I reported this to, uh, to the, the, the commander of the campaign. He said, Oh, I don't think we've seen this stuff before. So they sent a Rhodesian intelligence Corps team in down uh, flew them in from Salisbury to look at these things. And this is the first time they'd ever seen them in the war. And those were the missiles. Now this was a zipper camp on you. Zandler wasn't getting these things. The Russians were supplying zipper. And so it's the first time they'd ever seen these things in the war. And now two months later, they're used to bring down these two Viscount passenger aircraft. So it was a new weapon that had been introduced uh, by early 78. And uh, and they used them really effectively. And they're heat seekers, of course, as you know, they went in on any heat seeking engines. And so what the Rhodesian Air Force did was take all of its aircraft and put these big shields around the engines, as uh, deflectors. And, uh, and it added weight to our jump aircraft. These are C-47s. And so we couldn't put 24 paratroopers in there anymore with this added weight. So we had to reduce the uh, number of uh, paratroopers to 16 to account for this added weight of these uh, of these heat deflectors on the uh, two engines on the bike on the uh, C-47s. But that was the only change we made in the Air Force. So we could we could jump 16 at a time instead of 24 at a time as a result. And um, and uh, some Strellas were shot at the C-47s, but they never hit. So these these deflectors worked really really well. Wow. So the, the um so let's see the Russians were training Zipra and supplying Zipra with the Chinese you know giving aid to Zanla. That's right. Exactly. That's how it worked out. You find uh they they chose their sides and some North Koreans supported Zanla with Mugabe and so the uh, some of the more uh, some of the more qualified and uh, more adaptable and and uh, and more intelligent uh, of the Zanla went for external training. Some of those guys would go to Tanzania. Uh, they might go to Egypt. They would go to China or Vietnam, and they get trained there. Very political training, as you can know, all Maoists. Very theoretical. The Russians would take their people 
these were the Zipra that were located in Zambia, and they would train them there, or they would send them to Odessa and train them in their military school at Odessa in, in uh, the Ukraine, I'm sorry, in the Crimea. And uh, some of them would actually train in Moscow uh, and send them back. Now, they were probably more technically qualified, but they, everybody said, oh, Zipper, you know, the, the Russian train were so much better than Zamla. And I said, that's, that's BS, that's not true. Those guys, those guys were no better fighters than the Zamla were. They, they, I don't know where that myth started. I heard it from guys over there, but funny enough, not from the guys that were in the bush, from the uh, Rhodesia Light Infantry and Slew Scouts. They, you know, they said, you can't distinguish between the two. There's always the guys back in the rear. Oh, Zipper is so much better than Zamla. Um, and they didn't know what they were talking about. You went out there, and when you faced those guys, you knew you were facing essentially the same kind of enemy, just from a different, they were being sponsored by different countries, but they fought pretty much the same way. Um, Jeff asked a question, John, it says, to take your commission in Rhodesia, did that mean that you got dual citizenship with Rhodesia? Ah, good question. Uh, no, they did not require citizenship um, in fact, uh, I, I didn't sign anything at all except uh, an army, the equivalent of an army uh, conduct uh, set of papers that I'd abide by certain rules. There had a code of military justice there, and I said I'd subscribe to that in that, you know, wear the uniform properly, render, you know, salutes to senior officers and so on. But I didn't. It, it, from from a, uh, a civilian stand, from a citizenship standpoint, they didn't require anything of me at all. In fact, they wouldn't even stamp my passport. They would stamp a piece of paper and put it in your passport. And so when I go back to the States, I'd take that paper out and it would show that I'd never been over there. And that, and I'd get back into the United States. All it showed in my passport was that I left and then I was coming back. And somehow I'd always miss where I was when I was over there. You know, I'd usually go through England or something and have a British stamp in there. But I never had a Rhodesia stamp in the passport itself. They were very clever about that sort of thing. They knew people didn't want paper trails. So they just, uh, you know, they, they'd work around it. Let me, uh, ask you, uh, let me ask you one question, John. I, I meant to ask you before, and uh, I, I don't know where I heard this, but it was a rumor, and, and forgive me that it could have been a, that those Vicounts, at least one of them could have been a false flag just to derail the, the talks with Nkomo. Is there any truth that you think to that at all? Oh, no, no, no. There was nothing, nothing of the kind. Um, okay. Those were certifiable uh, shoot downs. I mean, I mean, I saw the pictures up there. I knew people who were killed on, on each of those missions, on each of those flights. I had two friends killed on the first one and one killed on the second one. Um, and uh, I mean, it was terrible, but what they had done there, I mean, they, uh, the, the, there were several of the flight attendants who had survived. They'd been raped and, and murdered after afterwards. Uh, in the second one, everybody was shot, uh, even children uh, after that, that who had survived. So, I mean, there were something like 50 or 60 people who were murdered right there on the spot. And it was before the security forces could get there. They knew where these things had gone down, but it was very remote out there in Matabi land. It was, it was like the middle of the desert and, and bush. It was just, there was nobody for miles and miles. It's not like it hit down near a city where you could get some of the security forces out there and, you know, in half an hour, 45 minutes. It took two days to get to these crash sites. And so anybody who'd survived uh, the crash was not going to make it. There were just too many zipper in the area. So uh, strange, I, yeah, I don't know where that, that came from, you know. Yeah, strangely enough, uh, we went to, there's a little town north of us called Rugby, Tennessee, and it's a very small, very unique little town that's worthy of its own show. But in that show, there was uh, we ran across an artist, and as soon as I heard her accent, I'm like, are you Rhodesian? And she's like, yeah, how did you know that? It's an unmistakable accent. Born and raised, she immigrated here. But we got to talking about what was your, you know, what were you doing during the Bush War? And she's like, well, I was a stewardess for uh, Air Rhodesia, Rhodesian Air, whatever it's right. called. Wow. And she said that uh, 
you know, she knew a lot of the people that were on it and it was just happenstance that she wasn't flying that day or she may have been shot down with one of those. And yeah, she, mm. uh, she had a really unique story to tell as well. But I want to ask you, John, as you think back on that time, what would it have taken for Rhodesia to win that war? Was it lost from the beginning or could they have won? And maybe uh, what, did victory, what would victory have looked like? Militarily, uh, we'd held our own really well. You know, we only had, uh, the, when you called up everybody and his brother and you emptied all the hospitals and uh, all the sick, lame and lazy and all of that, and you put them all in uniform, you'd get maybe 50,000 people in the security forces, men and women. But of that number, there were only something like 5,000 of us who were regular forces. That included the two Rhodesian rifle battalions. These were all African battalions, Rhodesian Light Infantry, Special Air Service, Salute Scouts, and so on. So we had a really small core of professionals who were fighting. Faced with something like 50,000 guerrillas in there and outnumbered by something like 10 to 1, the army held its own right up to the very end and never had a problem uh, facing down any military threat at all. Absolutely none. But the problem was that Rhodesia was a landlocked country. It had one lifeline, and that was through South Africa, and that's the only way it could get its oil and petroleum reserve up to Salisbury and dispense it to the security forces. And when the United Nations put so much pressure on the South African government that it could no longer support that lifeline and it had to withdraw its support from Rhodesia, that marked really the end of the war from a, from a, a practical standpoint. From a, from a theoretical standpoint, Rhodesia did not have the support of the African community at whole. And the reason for that was not because it was particularly badly mistreated but think about this you're you're living in a crawl 10 miles from a city who are you going to see more often a Rhodesia team coming through there once every two months or are you going to see or are you going to respond to this guerrilla group that comes through there once every three or four days where is your allegiance going to be and who are you going to serve as an intelligence asset for well of course those guys had the presence out there 100% of the time, we had the presence out there maybe 10% of the time. So we never had the African population on our side. Plus, they, the Rhodesians were kind of stupid in the way they treated the Africans in these protected villages. They didn't protect them very well. They did nothing like the British did down in Malaysia, where they gave them the water and food and schooling and protection and uh, everything they needed. To survive, and that's how the that's how the British beat the communists in Malaysia. Rhodesians didn't didn't take those lessons and learn them, and so these protected villages were dreadful. So the political they lost that political war really from the early sixties on. Militarily, yeah, they, they, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The protected <laughs> villages look like a Japanese internment camp to to me, just looking at them from the. You know, and they were, and they and, and they had the worst. Uh, they had. These guard force people who were little better than civilians with about a week of training, who were <laughs> almost worthless. They, you know, they, they couldn't guard themselves, much less guard a, a village itself. And they were hit quite often, and you know, they they didn't allow the people out to their farmlands like they should have, like the British had done in Malaysia. They made every mistake you could possibly make in a protected village, and it just really pissed out the people off. So they they lost the, the population. And that one was one of the political reasons they lost uh, they, they lost the war. They just didn't have the support of the people. Yeah, and I tell you, Ian Smith's book, uh, I think it's Bitter Harvest, is, is pretty interesting. Right, he, talk, right, he talks right. about, I think it was the breakdown of the Lancaster House uh, Accords and, you know, Kissinger and, and Carter getting in on it. And I think there's finally like this final phone call between Ian Smith and Kissinger where I think in the book he talks about Kiss Kissinger on the phone getting kind of emotional, like, look, guys, you had a good go. It's time to time to case the colors and let's do it. You know, it's over. Yeah, it, uh, it Carter uh, really undermined the legitimacy of the Smith government. Kissinger was not at all inclined to leave Rhodesia hanging out there. Not at all. 
he did what he was uh, sort of hired to do, you might say, and look out for the best interests of the government itself and try to at least recover some semblance of order uh, for the, the government and its people. Uh, Carter did not. Carter was four square and Vance, too, as a secretary of state, four square in favor of, of, of subverting Rhodesia and bringing that chapter of foreign policy to a close. And uh, I mean, his, he was all about human rights, as you recall. And he felt human rights of the African nationals were being violated so badly that there was no recourse but to shut down the government completely. And he, he succeeded in doing that. But I can tell you this, Rich, the, the, the military side of things, we were fighting right to the end. And um, it was really interesting that, that one of the conditions for the, the peace talks was that the, the guerrillas all get into these camps. And they, they'd stay in these big camps of like three and 4,000 of them. And that's where they were going to be. They'd case their weapons in there and so on. And we had a plan at the end of the war. <laughs> we were just going to roll into those camps and just flatten everything. And I was tasked with in one of those camps. I was a captain in the Sioux Scouts then. And I had a weapons platoon uh, of uh, 14 fives on, on vehicles. And I was going to take uh, one of the commandos, the RLI commandos, and there we get that would make about 140 of us. And we were going to hit this camp and it would just take out everything. Uh, but he, at the, I think two days before we were supposed to hit this place, uh, they said, no, you know, this is, this is, uh, it's going to be a useless gesture. We'd, yeah, we'd kill a lot of people, but it would just enhance the problem, political problem even more. But boy, we were, we were all set. I mean, I had armed these guys to the teeth. We had mortars. Uh, we had, uh, we had a coilless rifle. Us that we had 12, uh, 14 fives, uh, back there. Uh, we had guys that were chomping at the bit. That one guy burst into tears when I told him that we weren't going to do this anymore. It's just the, the mission, the mission was off. I mean, he was, he was set. He was ready. Guy wouldn't sleep. He didn't sleep for two days beforehand. I mean, <laughs> you talk about somebody who was looking forward to it, but, uh, now, no, got called off. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> and those raids did take place. You know, you were on oh, yeah. one at, uh, was it Chamoyo? Yeah. At Chamoyo. Yeah. The, um, those raids were the best planned things I've ever seen in my life. Um, Slew scouts did the operational work where they do the OP stuff, two man teams, Chris Schulenberg and, and an African, uh, national soldier would be with him and it do these two man recons. And they'd be out there two and three weeks mapping everything. And the Chamoyo complex was actually 10 camps all within about two K's of one another. So he'd mapped everything, mapped gun positions and so on. And, uh, we jumped in the, my, my commando parachuted in and the special air service parachuted in. And then two commando came in with, uh, choppers. And then, so that sealed off three sides of this camp complex. And the top, the northern tier, was patrolled by uh, K cars, six K car gunships. And so it was a, they were boxed in, and there were 10,000 uh, Zamla in this camp itself. And when we came in, they, they hit the camp initially with Viscounts and with the Canberras bombers. And so they flew a Viscount over initially. These guys were on parade. They were they were, you know, getting roll call and so on. So the the uh, one of the viscounts came over. Not viscount. I'm sorry. A vampire uh, flew over, and everybody sort of you know hit the road and ran and ran and and then uh, oh, it's false alarm. So they get back on parade, and then two minutes later, these Canberra bombers come right over and drop these golf bombs, which hit the ground and came up about 10 feet and then exploded into these balls and cut these ranks down. And it looked like, it looked like wheat, a wheat field. They were, they were lying in rows. It was, I'd never seen anything. I saw that the, uh, the aerials of that a uh, couple of days later, it was, I'd never seen anything like it, Rich. There were hundreds of them that were just lying flat in, in rows. They'd been killed right where they stood. They didn't even have a chance to move. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. And, um, and so then the SAS and the RLI and, and, and so on, and we closed this other three corners of this box and squeezed these guys in, and I ended up killing several thousand 
of these guerrillas in there. And we lost, uh, I think we lost four or five men killed in action. And people didn't believe these, these figures. The press didn't believe these figures. But when they were shown the photographs, and the government showed some of the photographs to Time and Newsweek and Look and so on, they had no argument. They said, well, okay, I guess you guys did what you did. But they accused us of hitting, a, you know, an insane asylum and a uh, and a, a, a kids, uh, you know, refugee camp. And initially, before they actually saw the photographs, and then they the press changed its mind about that once they saw the evidence. But it was a it it, it was a I don't know I, I I don't know how to call it any other ways but a slaughter. It was just a it, they fought guerrillas fought, but they were just overwhelmed because they got hit from so many different directions. They didn't know where to go and they couldn't run anywhere. And so they just died where they stood. Wow. wow. Jeff asked a great question, John. He says, what did your family and friends think about you going to sub-Saharan Africa to fight? Not much, Jeff, not much. Um, uh, my brother wouldn't talk to me for two years. He thought it was the most idiotic thing he'd ever seen in his life. And, um, a guy was an army veteran from Vietnam. I mean, he went to VMI. He was a, he was a you know, consultant engineer, professional. And he thought anybody who would do that sort of thing had lost at least three quarters of his gray matter. Uh, my mother was sort of resigned to it. My father, I'd lost my father several years before, so he wasn't a factor in it. But I can imagine what he would have said. He was an army officer. Uh, and I don't think he'd have been too keen on that. Um, but the guys I knew thought, hey, God damn, that's really cool. You know, what are you going to do? Send me something back there. Hey, what language do they speak over there? I said, well, they speak Rhodesian. Would have you learned that yet? Do you know it? I said, well, I'm working on it. Yeah, I'm working on it every day. And uh, I'm getting better and better at it. Uh, so there was a little ignorance that prevailed about the country itself and the people, which was, I thought, kind of funny. Because I think the country had been in a war for 10 years by the time I got there. Uh, but the answer, the answer to the question was, uh, most of them took a pretty dim view of my plans. I think they, they thought, because there's no objective to this. I mean, what the hell are you going to do with, with three years or four years in the bush? How's that going to fit on your resume? What's it going to look like professionally? You know, that's, that sort of thing. So, well, let me ask you this. I, I've never thought to ask you this before, but based on Jeff's question, had Rhodesia won, do you think you might've stayed? Uh, no. And I will tell you why I was pretty sick by the end of that war. I'd caught uh, typhoid paratyphoid fever from some dirty water when I was in Mozambique and, uh, my spleen and my liver were absolutely shot. And I, uh, I was sick as a dog. I'd lost weight. I could barely keep my head up. I mean, if that war hadn't ended when it had ended, I don't think I would have survived another six or seven months in the bush. I was really, really sick. And uh, I got home, and it took me almost ten years to recover from this. Uh, it was it was that bad. I mean, my it it just burned my insides out, and it was so easy to get sick over there: black water fever, malaria, elephantiasis, uh, dengue fever, malaria. I mean, you name it, uh, it's waiting for you. Uh, and you so, had already lost what ten feet of your intestines from getting shot. Yeah, in Vietnam. yeah, I, I'd lost ten feet. Of that, Jeez. and so I, uh, I, uh, I mean, I had a doctor. Uh, I had to go in for a routine uh, GI the other day, and he said, "Holy shit! I've never seen ten intestines that have been rearranged like yours have." He said, "I hardly knew where the hell I was going inside there." So it was a, uh, it uh, they cut everything off and reattached things to stuff that's never been reattached to, and so it's uh, it's a weird. I guess inside means a weird look. When they when they get in there and i i yeah i just didn't tolerate the water very well over there some guys did they were inured to it but my american stomach couldn't handle it tony asked what was the impetus that made john decide that 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 was a fight worth fighting that's a great question it is a great question um honestly it uh i i, I looked at that war at the time as one where you had a small population that was fighting a really large enemy, and I, I did not necessarily sympathize with the way the government was going about handling its racial issues. I thought it could have done a different, a, a, taken a different approach, and I, I did throughout the war. 
I even wrote a paper for the Army magazine that they wouldn't publish that I argued that point. That there's a different way to fight this sort of thing. But then I looked at the other side and I thought, man, they, the guerrillas are doing some horrible, horrible things to the European population over there and to the black population, too. The African population who were sympathizers with the government and who sympathized throughout the war with the government, uh, those people were just brutalized by the guerrillas. And I thought, you know, I'm no paladin uh, and I'm not going to save the world, but uh, I don't much care for the way that the guerrillas are going about fighting this war. And um, Rhodesians are, you know, they've got their problems, but uh, they're, some of them are really making an effort. To, to find a solution to this. And uh, maybe I can sort of lend them a hand and give them some extra time. Uh, it was not the strongest set of reasons to involve myself in somebody else's war, but I did it because I thought that uh, the Rhodesians might need a little bit of help trying to get a solution and buy time to find a solution to the political problems. And so, uh, I decided to end up, I ended up there on a three-year contract, what they call a short service contract, and then they wanted me to stay on a year later as Sleuth Scout, so I ended up staying a fourth year. Now, I'm glad you brought up the Sleuth Scouts, you know, so we talked about that the last time we talked about selection and what it was like uh, as an officer in the Sleuth Scouts. When you, and, and if you don't, for those that are watching or listening later in, in uh, to the show, if you're not familiar, the Selu Scouts has been referred to many times by not just me, but many, many other military historians, et cetera, who refer to it as the ultimate coin killing machine. And I say coin referring to counterinsurgency operations. When you hear that, John, as a former member of the Selu Scouts, is that a deserved reputation? I think so. I, I, I think so. The selection course itself made it uh, so that there were, very, very few people who were actually able to get into the unit. About one out of 10, one out of 12 who took the selection test, passed it. And and then those who ended up passing it had to take these various tests, at least during the, during the, the selection phase itself, particularly officers. We were tested in a lot of different directions. They'd give you an hour of sleep or whatever and wake you up and say, okay, here's this scene coming up. you got to set up a hasty ambush and here's here's the terrain. And you got to be out there. So you had about 10 minutes to figure out what you were going to do. And as an officer, they tested us a number of times during the uh, selection process itself. Um, no food for the first four days. Uh, it gave us water, but uh, they tested us in a lot of different directions. And, um, and most people just didn't pass. I mean, the physical side of it alone was a, was a killer, a killer. Uh, we had the ropes course that we'd run every day. We had these log runs in the morning. Um, we had uh, these push-ups. We had uh, rope climbs. Uh, we had endurance marches uh, with uh, 50 pounds of rocks in our in our pack. Uh, it, it just, I mean, by the time I finished that two weeks later, I was i was a broken man, honestly. I, 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 I'm surprised. I, I was 34 years old, so I was older than most of these guys who were doing it, who were probably in their mid-20s. But, my God, it, it almost killed me, Rich. It almost killed me. And, uh, and, and, and of course, they do the tactical. They train the tactical side of things, and so some guys didn't pass that. I mean, they passed all the physical stuff, but they didn't have the, the, the tactical side down because a lot of them had been – had not been real hardcore combat operations before then. They'd come in from one of the one of the reserve regiments where they did a lot of guard duty, but they hadn't been operational and done a lot of bush work. And so they passed all that physical stuff, but they didn't pass some of the tactical problems that we had. So the the selection test tested you in a lot of different directions, and particularly the officers. And then ended up there were just two of us, three of us officers who who ended up passing from my my course itself, and I think something like 12 began, uh, and there were uh, there were something like 120 guys who were on my course, and we passed 20, which was a very high rate. Usually, it's about, as I said, about 10% of the applicants passed itself. I think you mentioned, John, that one of your friends was fellow American Bob McKenzie. Is that correct? He was. He was with the Special Air Service. 
And uh, I've known Bob ever since I got over there. First operation I ever went on was an external attack on a camp in Mozambique called Ramanai. And uh, we walked into that. In those days, the guerrillas put the camps right next to the border. And as they kept getting hit more and more and more, they'd move these camps back deeper and deeper into Mozambique and Zambia. But when I hit, when we hit that camp in 76, it was a uh, only three or four Ks across the border into Mozambique. So we were able to walk in. And his SAS troop uh, launched the major assault, and we did the flank attacks on that with three commando in the RLI. So, uh, yeah, I, I met Bob almost from the day I got there, and we were friends right you know through the through the end of the war and. And afterwards, I worked on a contract with him, a uh, civilian contract in Washington, about 10 years after the war. So Bob was a good guy. Yeah, he was old. Was he killed in Sierra Leone or somewhere? He was he? he was killed in Sierra Leone. He was working up there as an advisor with uh, a couple of other Americans with the Sierra Leone Army. And uh, he got killed in a, in a contact with some guerrillas. Who were who just overwhelmed his? I guess he was in a vehicle uh, convoy, and he and this American were the last two survivors. I think some of his men sort of deserted him and left him and this other American alone to fight. And they were both killed up there at the time. That was good golly. That was in two thousand. What ninety six, ninety seven? Yeah, it's been a long time. Been a long time. But uh, that was a shame because he was a he was a really fine soldier. Um, there was, was he a, a former there was a, He was an army. He was with the Army Fourth uh, Infantry Division in uh, Vietnam, and he got shot with an M16 by a an NVA, a captured M16, and it took his whole right side out. I mean, I saw him one time, and he had nothing left over there. Rip Cage was gone. I mean, he really got hit badly. Um, but he uh, and the army army mustered him out. They wouldn't take. He wanted to stay in, but they said no. You physically got said, the hell with that. So he went to Rhodesia back in seventy two, and joined the SAS. And he was the most highly decorated American over there. He had a, a bronze cross Rhodesia and a silver cross, which is uh, equivalent to like a navy cross in the Marines or a distinguished wow. service cross in the army. He was very highly decorated. And he was a he was probably the most well known American uh, in the army. It's a, he was that good. He's a really really good guy. Mm. Do, do we have more time, John? I got a few more questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All yours. Okay, great. Now I'm going to switch gears here, and I want I, uh, I I would be remiss if I didn't use a man with your intellect and your PhD to ask yeah. some of these, some <laughs> yeah, of these questions. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Got to give credit where credit's due, but uh, there. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, let's talk about uh, something near and dear to everybody's heart. Where I think the Fed came out the other day and said, you know, that, that inflation is going faster than our models have predicted. And I ask you, you know, might we see some level of hyperinflation here in the American economy in the near near future? I doubt it. I don't think the economy is going to take off that much. Um, you get hyperinflation when the economy is very very active. It's it, In fact, it's overactive. And you get all of this money being spent uh, with not enough to spend it on. And that's what pulls prices up because you have shortages because demand is so high that companies run out of products and so they end up raising prices. It's called demand pull inflation. And, and we don't have employment at such a high rate right now that people are earning all of this money. When you have employment that's 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 low, like two percent or so, that means you have all these people working. They're spending huge amounts of money in the economy, and that is going to push prices up because they're the demand has gone up and prices are going to go right up along with it. So uh, we don't have that yet. There is some inflation right now because the economy is getting better. That's the whole point. Uh, and uh, the, the things that. The, the, the president has done is increasing job awareness and also opening up jobs that were no were no formerly closed when the pandemic hit so hard. But now the pandemic is getting better in sense of, you know, it's getting lower infection rates. You have more people going back to work. So they are spending a little more money and that's pushing inflation up a bit. 
but uh, Yellen, Janet Yellen, who's the chairman of the Fed, says that's it's probably going to be only temporary until businesses catch up with the demand for society. Once they catch up and they start producing more, then that inflation, it, it's only temporary. So we're, hyperinflation is something you saw during the Carter era, if you remember. I mean, inflation then, it was like 17, 18%, extraordinary. Now it's only a few percent. So, I mean, I can remember that when I got back from Africa, Africa. I couldn't believe the prices that were going up then, but we don't see that. We're not going to see that now, I don't think at all. There are some strange right. things right. going on in the economy, whether you look at lumber prices or, for example, rental cars. You know, being in Montana last week, we absolutely could not get a rental car. And now we're going to Michigan next week to teach all week. Can't get a rental car there either. So there's some really interesting things going on. I, I just wonder where it's all heading. And I, I wonder about the world economy as well. Do you think we may see some pockets of hyperinflation around the world since we're all kind of going through this together? Well, one of the theories of globalization is that you get these, uh, these, these supply chains that meet the needs of other countries. So, no country is self-sufficient. We all depend on imports from other countries. And when those imports are restricted or cut down, as they were during the pandemic, you find these supply chains interrupted. And when you can't get parts for something, then that product is going to cost much more because companies are going to look harder and pay more money for the products that they needed. They'll have to go someplace else. And it usually costs more. But but I think with the with this with the global plant pandemic settling down now, the supply chains are going to get back in order, and and the economies are going to reach an equilibrium. Now I don't doubt for one moment that there are going to be pockets of that, as you said. There, there probably are because not every country is going to get a supply chain reestablished in the same vein that it was before. There are going to be interruptions from who knows what any any. Anything can cause a supply chain interruption, but the pandemic just killed these these chains themselves, and that's what that's what hurt productivity in this country, and that's what laid off so many people. That companies couldn't get these products that they needed, these imports, and they couldn't produce what they needed, and so they had to cut these jobs back. But now that the supply chains are getting back in some semblance of order, and you're making connections with other countries, I think they're going to get the product lines starting to smooth out some uh, spare parts and so on are coming in. And I think the, there's going to be as, uh, an equilibrium reached. But, yeah, I don't doubt for one moment that there are going to be interruptions in there. And some countries are going to suffer more than others. There's, I, I just, they don't have the, for some one reason, they don't have the foreign exchange to buy stuff that they're missing out of the supply chain now. And uh, that's going to hurt the that's going to hurt their populations, mostly in developing countries, as you can imagine, yeah. not so much in Europe, Western Europe or Japan or Australia or so on. Great answer. So let me ask you this, John, those of us, we, you know, we heard about the Arab Spring. You know, I'd ask you two questions. What was it and was it a net positive or a net negative, John? That's that's the question of the day. Uh, it took place. The Arab Spring did in 2011. And a Tunisian um, vendor claimed that uh, he was being discriminated against by the government, uh, that he wasn't allowed to sell his products and so on. And, and this is in Tunis. And so he set himself on fire. And that raised the consciousness of the Tunisians. And they ended up uh, getting the government to resign and putting another government in on top of it that was more democratically oriented. And that spread to Egypt. And that took care of Mubarak. He was gone. And that spread to Yemen. And it spread to the UAE. And it spread to uh, Syria and several other countries. Some of these some of these succeeded. These revolutions succeeded. And some of them did not. But the it was it had brought in the feeling that we the people can do anything. But then it, it just lost its steam. And I must I have to blame the United States for some of this, too, because the U.S. ended up supporting uh, the overthrow of the elected leader in Egypt. 
who actually was with the Muslim Brotherhood and supporting this present guy by the name of Sisi. And he's just an autocrat from way back. And so they ended up killing those the Egyptian security forces, they ended up killing 10,000 people in demonstrations over there. 10,000 people who were just begging for some sort of democratic rights to be granted by the government. And the and the, the Sisi government didn't want to know anything about that and shot these people right in uh, uh, Medan Tahir, which is a big liberation square. I used to go there all the time and they just shot them. And that was his way of taking care of any sort of, uh, of uh, objection to government standards. And the U.S. just sort of turned a blind eye to that, which I thought was dreadful. And uh, and so you've got an autocrat in power and the autocrats have sort of regained their footing. They were thrown off balance by the, the Arab Spring, but they've, they've sort of recovered. Uh, that happened in Syria in particular, where you had the Syrian opposition get to a point where it was really threatening Assad. But then the Russians stepped in, as they always do, and lent him a lot of military support. And his side was able to crush the, the Syrian opposition, which is arrayed mostly up in the northeastern part of the country. So he's he dodged a bullet up there, Assad did. And then other countries, you know, other countries just sort of weathered the storm. So uh, Arab Spring had its day, but it's not, uh, it's not, it's not on the horizon now, I'm afraid. I'm sorry to say. So it, it lasted in Tunisia. Tunisia. I'm sorry. It lasted in Tunisia. It's still there in Tunisia. But that's really the only country that you see evidence of it. Yeah, I've, I've been to Tunisia. It seems quite a little bit moderate when I was there. So maybe that's part of what's enabled it to, to last. Mm -hmm. So net negative overall, John? Would you yeah, go that far? I, yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't see anything positive coming out of that uh, as we speak. Uh, in other words, you have the status quo has sort of returned to pre two thousand eleven. I mean, where do you see any sort of progressive democratic uh, movement thriving anywhere in the Middle East except in Tunisia? Uh, Morocco just uh, took over the Spanish Sahara. Trump granted them the right to that country because they he needed them to support the the Arab Israeli uh, um, yeah the Arab Israeli agreement that was negotiated by the Trump administration, and he had to buy Morocco's support for that. So he just let Morocco annex the Spanish Sahara. That was an independent entity before. It was a non-country. It was sort of a non-country that was had granted, who had leadership in the UN, but didn't wasn't a country status. But he just gave that 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 plot of sand away to Morocco to support. So you know, there's autocracy at work right now. Algeria, forget it. Tunisia, yes, as you pointed out, has a moderate sort of government. Egypt, not even close. Uh, Yemen is is galloping madly back into the 13th century. Uh, the UAE has stepped down on people. You have no sort of democratic rights there. Uh, the, probably the freest country uh, next to Algeria, uh, next to uh, Tunisia, might be Bahrain, because we have a large naval base there, and they want to make sure that they don't antagonize Americans too much. So it's a, it's a, a fairly decent place to live. Plus, you have a lot of foreign Arabs who live in that, that country. But no place else in the Middle East. Where do you see any democratic movement thriving? Anywhere over there? Nowhere. That's really, it's a shame, but it's, it's the nature of the, the, the business of politics over there. Yeah, and that leads yeah. me to my next question. Like, what is, um, what is Iran's role in regional destabilization and maybe funding some of the proxy wars that are going on in that region? Oh, they, they, they have thrived in that for years and years, and that's how you extend power. You, uh, you let somebody else fight your war. You hire, you get hired guns. You, you buy Hamas. You support Hamas, even though that's a, that's a Sunni group and the Iranians are Shia. As long as they're anti-Israeli, you're on, you're on my side. And so they, they do underwrite Hamas. A lot of money comes from uh, Iran that goes into Hamas's, uh, coffers. They, uh, have supported the, um, the Syrian government, because that's a Shia government against the opposition in in uh, in 
in Syria. So the, the democratic movement in Syria, such as it is, has lost tremendous ground over there because uh, Iran's been involved in that. They support Lebanon 100% with Hezbollah. That's a Shia movement. So that has been running Lebanon since the 1980s. And uh, they they support uh, uh, Qatar because that's a primarily Shia government itself, 45%. Um, everywhere you go and find Shia movements, you'll find Iranian uh, support. And, and one of the things that the Biden administration is trying to do is to weed is to, to weed this this support out, to minimize the support that Iran is offering these movements across the Middle East and to stir this problem up. They are heavily involved in Yemen with the Houthis. I mean, they've been supporting that movement for years and years and years, and that's why Yemen is such a basket case now, because you've had this tremendous amount of Iranian support. Who has been sending missiles into the Saudi Arabian oil networks? The Houthi rebels. Where are they getting the money for that? From Iran, uh, the Revolutionary Guards, uh, and it's, is uh, is uh, headed by a, a group called the Quds Force, which is a revolutionary force, and they're the external engine that Iran uses to stir up all of this trouble throughout the Middle East. And now you've got the election of a very, very aggressive, hardcore um, prime uh, president. The elections just took place. And he is not going to be easy to deal with. He's much, much more um, radical in his look uh, toward foreign policy than than Rouhani was, who was the head of the government before him. I can't remember his name. He just got elected. I'll think of it in a minute. And he's not going to be easy to deal with. So I don't know what the Biden administration is going to do in, in terms of trying to get Iran to uh, quit producing uh, uranium enriched, uh, you know, yellow cake, because that's how they're going to, of course, go into their, uh, put into their missile program. It used to be enriched, uranium was enriched about three and a half percent. Now they've upped it to 60 percent, and it gets to weapons grade when it gets to 90 percent. And they show every indication of, of refining this and enriching this uranium, this yellow cake, up to 90 percent. And if they do, God only knows what Israel's going to do. I mean, you can expect them, if, if, if Netanyahu had, had been in there, Israel would have bombed, would, would have gone in and bombed everything they could in Iran. I, I have no doubt about that, if they got to 90%. What, uh, what Bennett will do with, in Israel, I, it, it's anybody's guess, now that they're sharing power with a, a sort of modern, kind of, it's a little more moderate uh, a group than Netanyahu. Netanyahu was... Kanye was crazy in some in, in some respects as far as Iran goes. I mean, he was a wild man when it come to when it came to Iran. You could expect him to do anything, uh, but now that he's out of power, uh, it's hard to say what the is really response will be if the Iranians keep enriching this uranium. They're cutting their own throats by doing that. They really are. There's no reason for Iran to do this. They have. You don't have to enrich uranium past three and a half percent. That's the industrial strength you need for your nuclear reactors. You're doing it to be provocative. I mean, what are they going to do with a nuclear weapon? You tell me what possible use that's going to do, Iran. Not at all. It's just like it's like North Korea. North Korea spends almost all of its budget on weapons. But to what end? Is it for prestige? Yes. But that's what Iran is doing. It wants to be counted as one of the, the, the factors in international politics. And by joining the nuclear club, it figures, ah, oh, we have panache now. You know, we've got, you know, we've made the club itself. But the money that's going into that, that could be going into feeding its own people, it, 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 it's senseless. It's just senseless. And uh, Israel is going to react very, very poorly if they start getting up around that 80, 90 percent area. Yeah, of course, uh, Israel hit uh, one of Iraq's uh, reactors. They, um, they, there was a can Canadian engineer that was working on a long range artillery piece for the Iraqi government 20 plus years ago. And they assassinated him, I think, in Belgium. So 
is really will not, I don't think they'll allow that to happen, John. At, at 80% or something like that, before they reach the threshold, I think we can expect something major to happen, wouldn't you? No question. That that uh, attack you're talking about was a place called Osirak. Uh, and Saddam Hussein thought he's going to get cute and he's going to start making a nuclear weapon. <laughs> the Israelis um, flew, I think they requested overflight space uh, for Jordan. And I think Jordan granted them that. I think that's how it worked. They were, they, otherwise they would have had to fly down across the Persian Gulf and then up and that they would have to violate Iranian airspace to get to Iraq. But they threw, they think they, they ended up flying straight across Jordan and they bombed the living hell out of Osirak. And that was the end of the Iraqi nuclear program. Saddam Hussein thought, man, if they can do that, they can do anything. So he quit that right there on the spot. Um, and the Israelis will not hesitate to go after somebody like that. They just won't. I don't care who's in power. They're not going to hesitate. If Iran gets higher enrichment, the Israelis are going to act. And the United States is not going to be able to do a thing about it. Well, and, and Netanyahu's brother, Yanni, was uh, the commanding right. officer uh, who was killed at the Entebbe uh, rescuing right. hostages. That's so, right. Yeah. You know, um, you know, Netanyahu grows up in the shadow of his brother, who leads the, one of the most daring commando raids in history of warfare. They don't they don't play around. And I, speaking of don't play around, I want to ask you. So, John, you're either going to punch me in the face or something here. But when I see <laughs> when I see Putin look at Biden at their last time, it's like a python looking at a baby bunny. Am I wrong in that crude comparison? <laughs> um, Biden has a lot more going for him than I think people give him credit for. The guy has been in the Senate since he was in his 30s. He's older than I am now. I mean, he's 78 years old. He's been in politics for the better part of 40 years. He's he's met everybody. He was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's nobody's he's nobody's dupe. He knows he knows what he's doing. I think he I think people compare him to the way Trump acted with Putin, they, it, like they were brothers, they got along really well, arms around one another, hey brother, how's that going? And it showed, Trump tried to show that he was on an equal level with Putin and that he wasn't, uh, you know, he was one of the old boys club. Biden uh, was a, a great deal more circumspect, a great deal more reserved. I think he, mentally he figured you know he's got he's got putin's number he knows the kind of person he was the guy was head of the kgb there's no secret about what he's capable of and biden is no fool he knows foreign relations very very well much better than trump does and so i don't think i don't think there's anything to come out of that that you know deer in the headlights stuff that that some papers tried to express. I think Biden took it all in. I think he internalized it. I think he's biding his time. Uh, I think he understands. I think he knows Putin cold. I think he knows Putin better than Trump did uh, and what he's capable of and what he's done and what he can do. And I think he has a greater appreciation of Russian power than than uh, Trump did. Um it, it just it's 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 a completely different approach, Rich. And I, I I see the point that you're you're making. He wasn't really confrontational and aggressive and up in your face stuff, and that led people to believe, oh, you know, he's kind of afraid. And but I don't think that's the case at all. I think we need to give the guy credit for being a real statesman, which he is, and for knowing how to deal in foreign policy, which he most certainly does. Well, I, I'm going to hopefully try to share some of your optimism then, John. Hey, <laughs> hey Dr. Cronin, I've had you on here for right at two hours. It has been an absolute pleasure once again to have you on your third appearance on Coffee with the Rich. Uh, where can people find you? Where can they find your book? Uh, it's called The Bleed, B-L-E-E-D. Uh, and the subtitle is With the Marines in Vietnam and the RLI and Salute Scouts in Rhodesia. And it is on Amazon. You go in there; it's it's uh, it's an ebook, and it's also in paperback. So thank you for the plug. And I have both, and it's an outstanding book. I can't recommend it enough. Like I said, there was several of us officers reading it uh, 
<laughs> right, right, you know, about 10 years or so when it first came out and uh, we just loved it. And if, oh, you, if, you, if, you, if you have any interest in any of those subjects, whether it's getting kidnapped by terrorists, it's in the book. Some of the things about John's father in World War II, it's in there. Uh, Vietnam, Rhodesia, there's just so much to that book. And if you have any of those interests, you really need to check it out. I can't recommend it enough. Dr. Cronin, thank you for being on today. Rich Brown, you are a star and uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for having me on. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, as usual, first class questions. It's just, uh, I mean, you you really know your business and uh, and uh, it just shows with uh, you know the kind of professionalism you take into this show. So I do thank you very much for this. Thank you, sir. And folks, thank you for watching. And remember, the fight is coming. Be ready. So long, everybody.